Well, it's just about seven o'clock, so I think I'll go ahead and get started. I wanted to first welcome everybody to our Evenings with Genetics seminar series. My name is Pilar Magulis. I'm a genetic counselor at Baylor College of Medicine in Texas Children's Hospital. And so I work with Susan Fernbach on this series. And so we're very excited to be hosting this as a webinar. So the title of today's webinar is, Does Cancer Run in Your Family? Understanding the Genetics of Cancer. And so we will have three speakers today. Our first speaker is Tanya Ebley. Tanya is a graduate from the University of Pittsburgh Genetic Counseling Program and has been a genetic counselor at Baylor College of Medicine since 2004. She's currently the manager for the Adult Genetic Services and oversees the Baylor Medicine, Harris Health System, and Michael E. DeBakey VA Medical Center Genetics Clinics. She finds providing genetic counseling for patients with cancer-related indications to be particularly fulfilling because through knowledge and awareness, we can take steps to reduce the risk for many cancers. After her presentation, we will have Judy Karanika. Uh, Judy is the program manager of Judy's Mission Ovarian Cancer Foundation and has been in this role for over two years. She has her training in, actually though in mechanical engineering. And her main function is to promote awareness of ovarian cancer in an effort to increase early detection. Their main program for this is called Survivors Teaching Students, which is a classroom presentation for medical and nursing students. And then our third and final speaker is Ms. Nancy Kahn. She is a long-term survivor and long-term, long-time presenter for Judy's mission as an advocate for ovarian cancer awareness. She is um, BRCA positive, which you'll hear a little bit more about, and has a lot of information about family testing, precautions, and cancer, and is and we're so grateful that she's here to share her story with us today. And so with that, we will go ahead and start uh, Tanya's presentation. We are going to save the questions and answers for the end of all of the three presenters. And so Tanya's presentation will be first, and then I'll come back and introduce Judy, who will be speaking um, to you, and then we'll have Nancy, and then we will open it up for a question and answer session at the end. Hello. Thank you for joining me for this Evenings with Genetics webinar. I'm Tanya Ebley, and I'm a genetic counselor with the Adult Genetic Service at Baylor College of Medicine. I was invited to speak with you today about the genetics of cancer and how your family history can impact your risk to develop cancer. I imagine that many of you who are joining me have some personal or family history of cancer. And I say that not only because you're here to listen to this topic, but also because cancer is so very common. About 1.8 million people in the United States will be diagnosed with cancer this year, with the most common cancer diagnosis being breast cancer, followed by cancers of the lung and bronchus, and then by prostate cancer, which is the leading cancer diagnosis among men. Not only are people frequently diagnosed with cancer, but from this graph, you can also see that it's one of the leading causes of death in the United States, just under heart disease. And for individuals who are under 65 years of age, it's the number one cause of death. Looking specifically at breast cancer, we know that one in eight women, or 12% of women, will develop breast cancer at some point in their life. Similarly, both men and women have a lifetime risk to develop colorectal cancer in their lifetime. I'll come back to these two cancer types near the end of this webinar when I talk about genes that are related to an increased risk for breast or colorectal cancer. So I think we can all agree that cancer is common, certainly more common than we would like it to be. But a question I'm often asked is, is cancer genetic? Before I get into that question, let's talk a little bit about some basic genetics. Our genes are the instructions found in each cell of the body, and these genes tell the cell and the body how to grow and function. Some genes give instructions that help prevent cancer. Here, you can see a diagram of a cell, and inside that cell, we have these bundles of DNA. The individual instructions in the DNA are the genes. We know that we have two copies of each gene, one that comes from the mother and the other that comes from the father. For many, though not all, hereditary cancer syndromes, 
a person only needs one to have a mutation only needs to have one mutation in one copy of the gene in order to have an increased risk to develop cancer another question i often hear in clinic is do i have the cancer gene it's a great question but i'd encourage you to think about it a little differently we all have genes that when they're working properly help prevent cancer it's when we have a mutation in one of these genes that we end up with an increased risk a mutation which we sometimes refer to as a pathogenic variant is just a change in the dna sequence that causes the gene to no longer do its job in a sense you can imagine the gene was originally giving the body a message that said don't make cancer but if a mutation occurs and that gene doesn't work properly anymore then there is an increased risk for cancer however while cancer is genetic it's not always hereditary when we think about cancer and mutations i think about somatic mutations and germline mutations the somatic mutations are changes that occur in individual cells that lead to a tumor these types of mutations are not passed through families. The germline mutations are ones that are present in the egg or sperm of the parent, and then they're in every cell of the offspring. This is the type of mutation that is associated with hereditary cancer syndromes. These germline mutations are passed through families. However, these types of mutations only account for three to 10% of cancer cases. The other thing to keep in mind is that germline mutations do not guarantee that a person will develop cancer, but it does put them at a higher risk than the average person. This diagram shows the different paths we see with sporadic versus hereditary cancer. Right now you're looking at the path for sporadic cancer. Imagine these pink rectangles represent a gene in the body. The blue line on the gene represents damage or mutation on the gene that's related to a hereditary cancer syndrome. Remember, when the gene is functioning properly, it's giving the body instructions that help prevent cancer. When you see the thick blue line, that represents a mutation that causes that copy of the gene to not work properly. We start off with two copies of each gene. For most people in the general population, we've got two working copies. As we go through life, we may acquire a mutation. Over time, if we acquire a second mutation in the same gene, in the same cell, we can go on to develop cancer. Keep in mind, though, that the second mutation needs to happen in the same gene, in the same cell. It's almost like lightning needing to strike twice in the same spot. Now let's look at the path for an individual who has a hereditary cancer syndrome. So you can see this one looks a little different. If you look at the bottom half of the slide, you can see that the individual is starting off with one copy of the gene that isn't working. We've already got that one blue line. If the individual acquires a second mutation in that gene in any cell of the body, then they can go on and develop cancer because somebody with a hereditary cancer syndrome only needs to accumulate one more mutation in the gene in any cell of the body the chance of developing cancer in their lifetime is higher and the age at the time of cancer onset is often lower than what you would see in the general population with those somatic changes I hope that makes sense so here this graph shows the breakdown of sporadic familial and hereditary cancers. The most common type of cancer is sporadic or random cancer. That's making up that purple part of the pie chart. About 70 to 75% of cancer is sporadic. Sporadic cancers are commonly diagnosed at older ages, like in the 60s, 70s, or 80s. They can be associated with environmental exposures. Think, for example, of lung cancer and, and smoking. And in a family with sporadic cancer, there might be one or two family members with cancer, typically at older ages. Now the next slice of the pie is the familial cancer. This makes up about 20% of all cancers. 
With familial cancers, we might see a clustering of cancer in the family, still typically at older ages. But we believe there's probably a combination of both environmental factors and genetic factors that cause cancer in these families. For example, maybe a family has a, a grandfather and an aunt and a cousin who've all had lung cancer. They're all diagnosed in their 60s and their 70s, but all those family members lived in the same small town. We know these individuals share genes, but they also share the same uh, common environment. So finally, we come to our final slice of the pie. These are the hereditary cancers. These make up about five to 10% of cancer. With families that have a hereditary cancer syndrome, we typically see early onset cancer. So I'm talking about those cancers diagnosed in the 20s, 30s, and 40s. We see multiple generations affected with cancer. We can also see patterns of cancer. So for example, maybe we see a family history with both, bre with both breast and ovarian cancer in the family, or maybe colon and bladder cancer in the family. With these families, we are often able to identify a genetic mutation that increases the risk to develop cancer in these individuals. One more thing that I want to point out about hereditary cancer syndromes is that having a hereditary cancer syndrome does not necessarily mean a person will develop cancer. Likewise, many people will develop cancer even though they do not have a hereditary cancer syndrome. When someone does have hereditary cancer syndrome, the risk for cancer will be dependent upon the penetrance of the syndrome. The genetics provider will assess an individual's personal and family history to determine the likelihood that the cancer in the patient's family is associated with hereditary cancer syndrome and to determine which genetic test if any, might be most appropriate for the family. All right, this brings me to assessing your risk to have a hereditary cancer syndrome. As you are probably aware, a person's risk to develop cancer is due to many different factors. These can include lifestyle, environmental exposures, aging, and even chance. But the purpose of this talk is to focus on those factors related to your family history of cancer. Let's look a little more closely at the red flags you can look for in your family to get a better idea of whether you may be at risk to have a hereditary cancer syndrome. The first factor to consider when thinking about risk is the age at which an individual is diagnosed with cancer. Younger ages at the time of diagnosis increase the suspicion for hereditary cancer syndrome. For example, many women will be diagnosed with breast cancer in their 60s or 70s, but I'm more suspicious that there could be a hereditary cancer syndrome when I see a woman with breast cancer in her 30s or 40s. Rare cancers also increase suspicion that there may be a hereditary cancer syndrome in the family. For example, in the general population, it's less common to see a man with breast cancer. So when we see a patient who is male and has breast cancer, or a patient who has a family member who's male with breast cancer, we're more suspicious that there could be a hereditary breast cancer syndrome. Ovarian and pancreatic cancers also tend to be rare. So when we see these cancers, further genetic evaluation is warranted. Having multiple different, family, different cancers or the same cancer twice, such as bilateral breast cancer or bilateral renal cancer, also can be a red flag for hereditary cancer syndrome. Similarly, having two or more family members with the same or related types of cancer also suggests the need for further evaluation for a hereditary cancer syndrome. Here I have an example of a family history that looks very suspicious for hereditary cancer syndrome. This is a drawing that we call a pedigree. 
In this drawing of the family tree, the men are represented by squares and the women are drawn as circles. The person seeking an evaluation is a 35 year old woman. You can see that there's an arrow pointing to the circle representing that person. You can also see that several family members were young when they were diagnosed with cancer. This patient has a sister who was diagnosed with breast cancer at 30 years of age, and a cousin who was diagnosed with breast cancer at 37 years of age. There's also a paternal grandmother with breast cancer at 40. In this family, there are also two rare cancers, the father with pancreatic cancer and the paternal aunt with ovarian cancer. This family history is suspicious for a hereditary cancer. In this family history, we see a couple of things. We see young ages at the time of diagnosis, multiple generations affected, multiple family members with similar cancers, and rare cancers. For the purpose of giving a really obvious example, this family history is a little more extreme than most of the family histories we see in clinic, but I hope it does give you an idea of some of the things to look for in your own family. The other thing I want to point out about this family history is that you'll notice that the cancer in this family comes from dad's side of the family. Sometimes there's the misconception that if we're talking about breast cancer, we're only focused on mom's side of the family. But when it comes to hereditary cancer syndromes, both sides of the family history are important. A person can inherit a hereditary cancer syndrome from their mother or their father. This next example is of a family history that does not look very suspicious for hereditary cancer syndrome. Here, you see a grandmother with breast cancer at 70 on dad's side of the family, and an aunt with cervical cancer on mom's side of the family, as well as a maternal grandfather with lung cancer. In this family, the breast cancer was not diagnosed at a young age. Also, a lung cancer diagnosed at a relatively later age in an individual who was a smoker is more likely to be sporadic, as is cervical cancer, as cervical cancer is often associated with the HPV virus. Okay, so say after reviewing all of this, you feel like you do have one or more of the red flags we've talked about. And let's talk now about where you go from here. If you have a family history that seems suggestive of a hereditary cancer syndrome, you can seek genetic counseling from a genetic counselor or medical geneticist. Genetic counseling is a process to evaluate and understand a family's risk to have an inherited medical condition. Some of the things we hope to accomplish during the genetic counseling session include determining if genetic testing is right for you, and if so, which test is most appropriate. We'll also discuss the benefits and limitations of genetic testing, as well as the possible results of any testing. Once testing is complete, we'll help to interpret your test results and work with your physicians to plan appropriate cancer surveillance and management. We'll also talk with you about what the information means for your family members. In many cases, having this information not only empowers you to take the steps necessary to reduce your risk, it can also prevent other unnecessary testing or screening. Backing up a little bit though, let's talk about hope, how we hope to accomplish these things. In broad strokes, these are the steps for obtaining information and analyzing a person's risk to have a hereditary cancer syndrome and to develop a cancer associated with that syndrome. I'm not including the nitty gritty steps of counseling. This slide is more about the approach to understanding your risk and the steps you can take to reduce that risk. Depending on your individual needs, these steps might be rearranged a little, but in general, I find it helps to start by obtaining a good personal and family history. We'll talk a little bit more about that on the next slide. 
your genetics provider will use that information about your history to assess your risk to have a hereditary cancer syndrome. We'll talk about whether genetic testing might be right for you. Sometimes it might be suggested that a family member might be, more, uh, be the more appropriate person to test. If after discussing all the relevant considerations, you decide to proceed with genetic testing, you'll discuss the results of that testing with your genetics provider to better understand the implications of those results for yourself and for your family members. Ultimately, you'll use this information with your genetics provider and often with your other physicians to come up with a strategy of surveillance and medical management to reduce your cancer risk that works for you. As I mentioned, a key step is reviewing your history. It can help if you think about these questions before your appointment with a genetics provider. Be ready to provide answers about your own personal history of cancer, if relevant, such as the type of cancer or your age at the, and your age at the time of diagnosis. You will also likely be asked about your past cancer screening and management, other relevant exposures or risk factors, and known diagnoses, known genetic diagnoses. Depending on the reason for your visit, a woman might also be asked questions related to her estrogen exposure, such as her age at the time of her first period. You'll also be asked about your family history. Talk with your family members about any family history of cancer, the type of cancer, and the age of onset of cancer. Make sure you ask about all types of cancer, not only about breast and ovarian and colon cancers. I know that those are the ones I'm focusing on today, but other cancers can be important too. Ask if any of your family members have had genetic testing. It's also important to gather ages of unaffected family members. Seeing many family members who are in their 70s with no history of cancer can be much more reassuring than only seeing individuals who are in their 30s or 40s with no cancer. It's possible they just didn't age old enough to develop that cancer yet. If you're aware of other risk factors, such as smoking, it can help your genetics provider to accurately assess your risk if you can provide that information. Here's a couple of additional things to keep in mind. So not all families or family members have an equal degree of comfort when talking about family history. Also, an absence of family history doesn't necessarily rule out a hereditary cancer syndrome. Sometimes this information can be lost or unknown over time. Other times there can be misattributed paternity. So some of the relationships within a family aren't exactly what we think they are. And sometimes a person may be the first person in the family to have the hereditary cancer syndrome. It has to start somewhere and it's possible that it started with that first person who has cancer. Also, knowing what you don't know can be important for your genetics provider. So if you know that you have limited information, don't feel like you can't seek a genetics evaluation. Just come prepared to talk about whatever part you do or don't know, and we can try to assess your risk from there. If you or a family member had genetic testing, it can also be very helpful if you're able to provide a copy of that test report at the time of your genetic evaluation. Which brings us to genetic testing. If you and your provider decide that genetic testing is a good next step for you, there are several laboratories that provide testing for hereditary cancer syndromes. On this slide, I've named just a few. The genetic testing is essentially reading through a number of genes to look for a mutation associated with a hereditary cancer syndrome. Currently, many tests are what we call multi-gene panels. The genes included on the test could vary slightly from panel to panel. Your provider can suggest the test that makes the most sense for you based on your personal and family history. A good thing about panel tests is that we can look at multiple genes at the same time. 
This can cut down on your wait time for answers and is less expensive than testing methods in the past. A drawback can be that when we're looking at more genes, there's a greater chance of getting surprising or uncertain results. I'll talk more about that in a moment. Another reason panel tests make sense is that often many different genes can't be, can be associated with a single type of cancer. So on this slide, you can see that I have a diagram on the left with breast cancer surrounded by the names of multiple different genes. Mutations in any of these genes are associated with an increased risk for breast cancer. Using a panel test can allow us to look for mutations in any of these genes at the same time. On the flip side, we know that each gene can be associated with multiple cancer types. So on the right side of the screen, you see a gene, TP53, surrounded by the many different types of cancer that can be associated with this gene. This brings me back to my point about surprises. A person could, for example, seek a genetic evaluation due to their family history of colon cancer and find out that they're at increased risk to develop ovarian and uterine cancer too. Other types of surprises can be harder to define, such as unexpected emotional reactions to results or changes in family dynamics. Another consideration when thinking about testing is that when searching for something rare, it can be best to start the search with the most likely target. I kind of alluded to this earlier when I mentioned that you might be asked about testing family members. Sometimes when we see an individual who has no personal history of cancer, we might suggest that testing an affected family member might be more informative. Often though, this isn't possible. People may have passed away, Maybe they're just not in contact, or sometimes family members don't want to have testing. We don't always start by testing an individual who's had cancer. So even if you have no personal history of cancer, if you have a family history of cancer, you might want to seek a genetics evaluation. You should also be aware that when genetic testing is done, the answers aren't always as concrete as we might want them to be. We might want to get normal results that rule out the most common hereditary cancer syndromes, or some patients even say that they would want to get positive results that explain their history and open the door for clear recommendations for reducing risk. But there's always the possibility of getting a result that falls in more of a, a gray zone. We can find mutations in a gene that we didn't expect, which give a risk for an uh, a different type of cancer, maybe a cancer that we didn't expect based on our family history. Or we can find a change in a gene that isn't well known and perhaps right now there aren't clear guidelines about what to do to reduce that risk. We can also sometimes get inconclusive results, meaning we found a change in a gene but we don't yet know if it's associated with an increased risk for cancer. This diagram shows the spectrum of different types of results we may receive. A result classified as pathogenic or likely pathogenic may be used by your healthcare provider to influence your medical management. On the other hand, if you have a result categorized as a VUS or variant of uncertain significance, the clinical effect might not yet be known and your provider might use what's known about your personal history and your family history to influence your care more than they use that genetic test result. Two more things to think about with regards to genetic testing for hereditary cancer syndromes are GINA and the cost of testing. GINA is the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act. It provides protection from genetic discrimination from health insurance companies and employers. However, it does not apply to other types of insurers such as life insurance or long-term disability insurance. There are also some exclusions to this protection. You can learn more about GINA at ginahelp.org. Another concern people may have about 
um, another concern that people may have are about out-of-pocket expenses of genetic testing. We've come a long way, and many insurance companies now do provide coverage for genetic testing for hereditary cancer syndromes, but every person's policy is different. Some insurance companies might lag behind others, um, or they might have specific rules about who can order genetic testing. For example, some insurance companies require that a person be seen by a genetic counselor or by a medical geneticist in order for the cost of that test to be covered. Like I mentioned, every plan is different, so if you have concerns about whether your genetic test will be covered, you can reach out to your insurance company to ask about their policy. Okay, let's switch gears a little bit. I wanted to briefly mention some examples of hereditary cancer syndromes. Because of the frequency of breast and colon cancer, I'll focus on these two cancer types, but keep in mind that other syndromes can lead to different types of cancer, such as thyroid, renal, pancreatic, and gynecological cancers, as well as melanoma, just to name a few. As we discussed earlier, hereditary cancer syndromes account for a relatively small percentage of cancer. In this pie chart, you see that hereditary cancer syndromes account for about 5 to 10 percent of breast cancer. These are some of the genes that are known to be associated with breast cancer. One thing I want you to notice is that in addition to breast cancer, each of these genes is associated with other types of cancer. So for example, people with a pathogenic variant or mutation in CDH1 have an increased risk for lobular breast cancer, and they also have an increased risk for gastric cancer. Mutations in PALB2 are also associated with an increased risk for pancreatic cancer. Here you can see a different type of breakdown of genes associated with breast cancer. You can see that some genes are considered high-risk genes. These can have a lifetime risk of breast cancer of up to 87%. Other genes have a more moderate risk of, say, 20 to 50%, while still others have a lower or less well-defined risk. Your genetic provider will discuss with you in more detail the significance of your results. For example, this table shows the risk for a person who was found to have a pathogenic variant in BRCA1 or BRCA2. You can see that the in individual has risk for breast cancer, ovarian cancer, and other cancer types as laid out in this table. Like breast cancer, colon cancer is also largely sporadic, but there are a number of well-described syndromes that increase the risk for colon cancer. One example is Lynch syndrome. Lynch syndrome is a syndrome that increases the risk for uterine and ovarian cancer, as well as for colon cancer and other cancers of the digestive tract. Another example of a genetic condition with an increased risk for colorectal cancer is familial adenomatous polyposis, often called FAP. This condition can lead to hundreds of colon polyps, as well as colon cancer. As you can see, the risk of colon cancer is substantially increased when there is a hereditary cancer syndrome. In the general population, the risk to develop colon cancer is about 5%. The risk is increased when there's a first-degree relative with early-onset colon cancer, but it can be increased all the way up to around 70% with some Lynch syndrome genes and to nearly 100% with FAP. As I mentioned, these are by no means all of the hereditary cancer syndromes that we see. If you have concerns about your personal or family history of cancer, you might want to seek out a genetics provider. We have several genetics clinics that can provide evaluations for hereditary cancer syndromes at Baylor College of Medicine. We have a clinic at the Michael E. DeBakey VA Medical Center for patients who are veterans. If you're a patient at the VA, you can ask your doctor for a consult to genetics. 
We also have a clinic through Harris Health System. Here we see patients who live in Harris County who often don't have health insurance. You can ask your Harris Health System provider for a referral to the genetics clinic or call the number listed on the slide for more information. We also have a self-pay clinic called Consultagene. Again, you can call the number on the screen if you're interested in more information about this clinic. And finally, we have a Baylor College of Medicine genetics clinic, and if you're interested in scheduling an appointment, or if you'd like more information, you can call the number on the screen, or email us at adultgenetics, that's all one word, adult, no space, genetics, at bcm.edu. If you're outside of the Houston area, you can also find a genetics provider near you by using the Find a Genetic Counselor link on www.nsgc.org or using the Member and Service Locator tool that can be found at www.acmg.net. I hope that through this webinar, you've achieved a better understanding of basic genetics related to hereditary cancer syndromes, what to look for in your family history to determine if you might benefit from a genetics evaluation for cancer, and the next steps you can take. Thank you so much for your attention today. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you so much, Tanya. Um, and so now we're going to have uh, Judy, our next speaker, um, share her screen for her presentation. Again, we'll save all the questions for the end, but you'll be able to either unmute yourself or write the questions in the chat. Okay, Judy, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Let me um, see if I can get my share screen back to screen one. Um, thank you, um, Pilar, and, and thank you, everybody, for uh, indulging me. My, so my presentation, I am with Judy's Mission and I, my name is Judy, but not, uh, that's not why Judy's Mission is Judy's Mission. We're a local ovarian cancer foundation. Our main um, purpose is to spread awareness about ovarian cancer because as the slide says, awareness is power and early detection saves lives. So our main goal in, in doing this presentation and most presentations is not so much uh, the genetics portion, but I did add some genetics, uh, more genetics than I normally would in a presentation. Uh, but to uh, when we have a captive audience to try to make you, you aware of what to look for, what to know, to understand about ovarian cancer, especially the signs and the symptoms and how to detect it and, and detect it early. Uh, things that, you know, a lot of things in the presentation will surprise you and, and, and hopefully if um, you yourself uh, feel like something you hear in my presentation or Nancy's presentation applies to you or somebody you know or your family or a friend um, has uh, symptoms that, that you'll react a little earlier and, and the results will be better than what you're going to find out they are based on this presentation. So uh, the slide here does have our, our website address and I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about Judy's mission uh, nor the Judy in, in the next slide that it's named, but I will at the end of the presentation put a, um, a file in everybody's chat that's uh, got all the information, nice little kind of a gift, um, one sheet or yeah, one double-sided sheet of all the information uh, that you need to know to remember uh, in case um, in your future you feel like you might be a victim of ovarian cancer. So this woman, Judy Liebenthal Robinson, is um, uh, somebody that did unfortunately not survive her ovarian cancer, and that's who her friends uh, developed our organization in her honor. Uh, but you can go on our website and read more about her. I'm not going to spend I'm talking about us. So, uh, oh, Judy, real quick, when, um, would you be able to put it in presentation mode, real quick? Um, yeah, the bottom not. of the, um, on the, f on the far bottom, on the little icon next to the oh. where you zoom. Um, um, maybe I might need to do a slideshow. I'll do slide. Can I do? Slideshow? Oh, slideshow. Yeah, that'll work too. It didn't do it. Did it didn't do anything. Did it not do anything? It's still just the slide. Oh, from the beginning. Okay. Yeah. Right. From the beginning. Oh, okay. Wow. Perfect. Okay. Thanks. Okay. So, enough from her. So, um, thank you. I'm sorry about that. So, the, the main objective of my presentation is for any audience to know uh, and understand the risk factors if you're in a high risk group, that, like Tanya said, and I'll talk about a little in this presentation. Um, uh, sporadic uh, cancer is more 
makes up more of the, the ovarian cancer than does um, those with high risk factor. But, but if you're in a high risk group, your risk can be significantly high. Uh, but mainly to know the symptoms, uh, to understand the symptoms, uh, which you'll find out are very um, unusual and, and are not, not actually are very common. And so not unusual to be associated with uh, ovarian cancer. And then to know what to do if um, you do feel like you're experiencing symptoms of ovarian cancer. And then I have a slide on where to get more information. So I have a lot of facts and I'm gonna run through them kind of quickly because they are in the sheet that I'll put in the chat uh, for everybody. But uh, um, as Tanya pointed out, there's a lot of, none of the cancers that she mentioned as the most common types of cancer were ovarian cancer. And in fact, ovarian cancer is only number 11 among all cancer in women, not even number one among the five gynecological cancers, but it is the number one most deadly among the five gynecological cancers. And even uh, number five most deadly among the uh, all cancers in women. So even though uh, there are 11 or 10 other cancers more common than ovarian cancer, there's only four of them that are more deadly than ovarian cancer. Uh, only, um, I say only, but about 22,000 women are diagnosed each year with ovarian cancer, uh, about 14,000 uh, in, in the United States, 14,000 women die of ovarian cancer. Um, Tanya said, I think she said one in um, eight women, that's about 12% of all women will have uh, uh, breast cancer. That's a lot lower odds with ovarian cancer, only about one in 79 or 1.3% of all women. So like I said, it's not very common. And when I do talk about the symptoms, uh, the more times than not, they're not ovarian cancer, but we want you to be aware. Uh, the average uh, age for ovarian cancer is 60, but um, we do have a lot of women that, that and we'll talk about that, the risk factors um, based on age. Um, and about two thirds of all ovarian cancer is diagnosed at stage three or four, the latter stages where the, um, the risk of uh, the likelihood of survival is a lot less than if it would be diagnosed early. Uh, the symptoms can be vague or um, not, not thought of as ovarian cancer. Um, and, and the symptoms can be present in the early stages. In fact, I work with a lot of ovarian cancer survivors and most of them were diagnosed at the latter stage. And I will I'll ask them, I'll go in hindsight, now that you know what the symptoms are, were they possibly present earlier? You just didn't think about them. And when we talk about what they are, you'll probably feel like you're in the same boat. Um, if detected early stage one, ovarian cancer survivors um, have a 93% survival rate for, at five years. So why is ovarian cancer diagnosed, rarely diagnosed early to about 20 to 30% of the time um, ovarian cancer is diagnosed in the early stages where the survival is much more likely. Uh, one reason is there's no screening for ovarian cancer. So unlike breast cancer that has a pap smear or, or cervical cancer, or sorry, breast cancer that has a mammogram and cervical cancer that has a pap smear or, or prostate cancer that has a PSA test and a lot of the other cancers that have regular screening and everybody's encouraged to do regular screening. There's no such screening for ovarian cancer. The pap smear test is not a test for ovarian cancer. So if you have been to your gynecologist recently and had a full gynecological workup and you're having these symptoms that you're saying it can't be anything gynecological because you had a full workup, there was nothing done in that exam that would have detected ovarian cancer. Uh, so here's a little chart that really explains why why I do this. So this um, the lighter portion. Let me see if I can get my annotated pointer. Um, anyway, the the very light portion of uh, the light green is 60 percent. Uh, this is for stage three and four ovarian cancer. This very very light says uh, six uh, percent of ovarian cancer. Uh, that says it's non non stage. They had they didn't determine the stage. I'm predicting that's probably people with fourth stage ovarian cancer. So third and fourth stage ovarian cancer you can see have uh, on the chart that tells the survival for five years uh, less than thirty uh, percent. In fact, that very small one that they said it's not staged. I'm guessing that's uh, those were fourth stage ovarian cancers because uh, the survival rate for five years is only 24%. The very dark uh, green is your stage one ovarian cancer. So my goal for uh, doing these presentations is to turn this pie chart around and have the two thirds portion be the, the uh, stage one ovarian cancer where 93% uh, survive past five years. And then the medium dark is a stage two uh, ovarian cancer. 
So here it says by region. So those um, cancers that are isolated to just the ovaries is stage one, and those that are isolated to the pelvic region are stage two, and then those that have um, metastasized outside the pelvic region, uh, that's the most common time that it gets diagnosed. And like I said, hopefully with presentations like this, that'll get turned around. Uh, so here's uh, some factors. I said about 1.3% of all women will ever be diagnosed with ovarian cancer. Those odds go up for people with family history. And uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that in the um, genetic mutations on the next couple of slides. Uh, Null of uh, the more uh, menstrual cycles a woman has had, the more higher the risk of ovarian cancer. So women that have had no children are at higher risk. I already talked about the Average age is uh, 60, so women in the age range of about 55 to 65 are at higher, much higher risk, or not much, risk, somewhat higher risk. Um, and obesity and endometriosis also increase that risk to some extent. Some factors that would decrease the risk of ovarian cancer, certainly if you didn't have ovaries, uh, your, your risk is significantly lower and if you didn't have the fallopian tubes. Again, that increases uh, oral contraceptives. So to some of you that may be counterintuitive because you know that oral contraceptives increase the risk of breast cancer. However, because they decrease the number of menstrual cycles, uh, oral contraceptives decrease the risk of ovarian cancer and um, significantly, in fact, in fact, I was at one presentation about a year ago, similar to what Tanya just did, where the genetic counselor said that in some cases, if the patient tests positive for a certain BRCA mutation that, that significantly increases the risk of ovarian cancer that will prescribe, if a patient is not ready to have their ovaries removed to reduce their risk of ovarian cancer, they'll prescribe the oral contraceptives. All, full well knowing that uh, that actually will increase that patient's risk of breast cancer, but also knowing that they'll be able to uh, catch that breast cancer at the early stage and they would not with the ovarian, they would like to avoid um, the patient getting the ovarian cancer more so even than breast cancer. Um, also, I said women that have had no children are at higher risk. So women who have had children and who have breastfed those children have had fewer menstrual cycles. So that would decrease the risk. And then those uh, women that have not had their fallopian tubes uh, removed, but have had their tubes tied would be at a lower risk. So some of the family history. Uh, so if you yourself or someone in your family had uh, breast cancer or previous ovarian cancer or uterine or colon or colorectal cancer, uh, those would be women that would be at higher risk. And I'm not going to get into exactly the percentages and what, uh, you know, what level of a relative would have had to have it like uh, Tanya would, because I'm not really versed in that. Um, the genetic mutations, BRCA1 and BRCA2, uh, like Tanya said, do increase the risk of ovarian cancer relatively significantly and uh, the Lynch syndrome also. And I do have a couple of slides that go into a little bit more on the mutations. So I'll, uh, Ashkenazi Jewish women, women are those that are of Ashkenazi Jewish descent, even if they're not Jewish, no longer Jewish, but um, Ashkenazi Jewish women, a high percentage of BRCA1 and BRCA2 positive women are Ashkenazi Jewish. So uh, if you're Ashkenazi Jewish and you haven't been tested for BRCA1 or 2, uh, you would possibly be at a higher risk group. However, so we said that um, there were a lot of factors that would increase your risk of ovarian cancer, that if you're older, um, that, uh, that you're at higher risk. If you have never had children, you're at higher risk. Well, there are plenty of um, women that never had children that, uh, or that, did, that did have children that uh, still ended up with ovarian cancer. There are younger women that have ended up with ovarian cancer. And we said that uh, having your ovaries removed um, would decrease your risk, but um, even without your ovaries, women can develop primary peritoneal carcinoma, which is a form of ovarian cancer. Uh, certainly women who have uh, ovarian cancer once they're diagnosed the first time will almost always have their ovaries removed and they will almost always have a recurrence even without the ovaries. So none of the, um, if you're not, so if you're not in a high risk group and we'll talk about um, the sporadic versus the uh, hereditary and, and the, or whatever, all the other risk factors. So if you're not in the high risk group, and you're having the symptoms, you can't um, rule out ovarian cancer. And certainly if you're in a low risk group or if you've um, taken uh, oral contraceptives, uh, you can't rule out ovarian cancer. They do reduce the risk, but they don't um, eliminate them. So uh, a little bit about the BRCA, just since this was a genetics. Um, so 
this uh, one, the chart on the left, um, the big portion, 82, I've always been told 85% of, of ovarian cancer is sporadic. This study was uh, almost 2,000 women and it looked like 82% of those women uh, had no genetic mutation and about 18% had, um, had some genetic mutation. Of that 18% of the women that had ovarian cancer and did have some genetic mutation, about 20% of those were other than BRCA. So it looks like BRCA1 was about a little over 50% of, uh, of the genetic mutation ovarian cancer. BRCA2 is just under, it looks like 30%. And, um, and all the others, uh, the MMR, the uh, mismatched uh, repair is, is the Lynch syndrome. So that's one of the more common. Um, so this next slide is the same as that right side of the previous slide, but uh, so, um, I think uh, Connie had on her slide that the BRCA1 increases the risk of ovarian cancer to 40, between 40 and 60%, and BRCA2 uh, increases the risk of ovarian cancer to about between 20 and 30%, and um, all these other mutations, uh, those if you're, if you're po positive for some of these other mutations, the average is about 8%. Um, risk of ovarian cancer. So these um, are the four symptoms that, that we want you to pay special attention to. The top four symptoms here, the bloating, it's an abdominal bloating, and I, most of the survivors that I work with say that it's not just a flabby, like I have a big flabby stomach, but it's uh, hard and, and uh, bloating, and it doesn't, and nothing relieves it. And uh, it's urinary frequency where you feel like you might have a UTI, but you don't have a UTI, certainly pelvic or abdominal pain, uh, depending on what uh, type of tumor, what size and where it's located, but that's very common. And difficulty eating or feeling full, eating a little bit and feeling full quickly. So these four symptoms are common to almost all ovarian cancer patients. Unfortunately, um, there are symptoms that are very common to a lot of other ailments. There are symptoms that are very common in, in most women. Uh, at some point, you have some type of ab abdominal bloating. You certainly at some point have some type of pelvic and abdominal pain. Uh, when you get to my age, I'm having now a lot of UTIs, uh, so the urinary frequency or urgency to, to urinate. And uh, unfortunately, I never have the last one that's not going full quickly, but, uh, but that is very common. And, and all of these symptoms are very common to a lot of other ailments. And uh, some of them are just, you know, just uh, present in women. So when I said that these uh, symptoms might be present early in the ovarian cancer, if you're like me and like most of the survivors I work with, there are um, symptoms that you don't uh, think much of. They're, they're just common to women. And so you don't talk about them. In fact, a lot of those survivor stories that I hear, uh, they're, they've gotten very severe and, and almost unbearable before you even mention them to the doctor. So that's another reason we're doing this presentation. We certainly don't want you to be afraid of every little tummy ache that it could be cancer. But on the other hand, if you're having uh, if your stomach's bloated, and, and especially if it's hard, and, and you're exercising and everything else, and it may be thin, and, but you've still got a bloated stomach, and you've got uh, this pain in the abdominal or, or pelvic area, and you feel like you have to urinate all the time, and then you're having this trouble eating, uh, and even though it's just a little bit of, the, of these symptoms, but um, in the next slide, we'll talk about the persistence of these down here at the bottom, some sim more symptoms of ovarian cancer that are uh, not so some are common, but but not in the the percentages of almost all cancer patients. So some back pain, fatigue. Um, you'll hear from from a lot of ovarian cancer patients. Uh, certainly constipation, depending on what where the tumor is, um, and uh, weight weight gain and weight loss. But in particular, those first four: the bloating, the abdominal pain, the frequent urination, and the feeling full quickly. If um, those are persisting for uh, two weeks or more and with no relief, or if they're occurring frequently, then maybe they're coming and going, but, but several times over the course of the same month. And they're unusual. Sometimes uh, you'll hear the patients say, yeah, I've had bloating, I've had abdominal or pelvic pain, I've had frequent urination and then feeling full quickly, but this feels different. This is different or it's unusual. Um, and certainly um, you've tested for everything under the sun, sort of, uh, UTIs, uh, digestive issues, colorectal issues, and doctors tested for everything and, and none of those are present. Uh, then we highly recommend that these are the things you talk to your physician about. Have the physician do a pelvic or rectal exam to see if they feel any suspicious masses. 
a transvaginal or pelvic ultrasound or a CT scan to see if they see anything and this CA125 blood test. So the CA125 blood protein uh, is, says it's an irregularity, but I think almost everybody, everybody has some CA125 uh, is protein in their blood. The normal level for it, I've heard 32, 35, so we'll say uh, 35. If the CA125 is higher than 35, statistically, it's been shown about 50% of the time that is over, that's an indication of ovarian cancer. 50% of the time, there's other um, ailments that would cause that to be elevated. But if uh, you're having these uh, symptoms, the bloating, the frequent urination, the uh, uh, pain in the pelvic and abdominal area, and the feeling full quickly, and then you've been having them for uh, persistently for a period of a couple of weeks, and you've had them uh, been tested for all the other possibilities that, that, that could explain those, and especially if the doctor has uh, perceived a, a mass during the pelvic or the rectal exam, and they've seen something on the ultrasound or the CT scan, and also the CA125 is elevated, then that should be a big, big red flag, and you should recommend that your doctor refer you to a gynecologic oncologist. So this is a specialty field of oncology where this particular oncologist has had extra years of training specifically in the gynecological cancers. And this is the, your best bet. If this, is, if this is your situation, that's gonna be your best bet for survival with uh, ovarian cancer. So um, these are a few other uh, resources. Um, I guess this will be recorded. I don't know. I would screenshot this page if I was uh, if I was you. The, um, uh, although, I, sorry for Baylor, I do have a competitor name up there that we work closely with. Um, our, our website is on there. Judy's mission: OCRA, Ovarian Cancer Research Alliance, is the national organization that actually devised the uh, Survivors Teaching Students program, which is. Uh, PowerPoint very similar. I took a lot of their slides for this PowerPoint, and, and so we were there. We're kind of there for the survivor teaching students program. We're their uh, facilitator here in the Houston area, but they do have a lot of great information on their website about ovarian cancer in general. Uh, in the OCC, the uh, National Ovarian Cancer Coalition, uh, their website's real easy. They're the one that got just ovarian.com. And they do have a whole lot of really good information and uh, hopefully it never happens. But if you or anyone you know is ever diagnosed with ovarian cancer, they have um, guides on uh, the whole booklet on um, if you're newly diagnosed and, and all sorts of uh, other information that's really good. And certainly the American Cancer Society has all sorts of very good and useful information on all sorts of things. So uh, that was really quick. I'm going to just... Uh, hand it over to Nancy and right when Nancy starts talking, I'm gonna put a file in your chat. So if you could um, at some point load that file onto your computer, that's kind of our little gift to you. But it also, because I talk very fast, that has a lot of the same information in, in that. So with that, I'm going to say thank you. And I'm going to see if I can load. Nancy does not have a slideshow. So uh, Nancy, if you can turn on your camera, your video, I will spotlight you. All right. Uh, okay. okay, great. All right, any good. Let me spotlight right. you and I will say to everybody. Okay, everybody, this is Nancy. Okay. Hi, hi. My name is Nancy Kahn and I was diagnosed 16 years ago with stage four ovarian cancer. I've had three recurrences since then. I'm what my cancer doctor calls an outlier because less than 40% of women diagnosed with ovarian cancer are alive five years later. And I think it's actually more like 30, less than 30%. Uh, I think that's what Judy said. Um, but anyway, at the time of my diagnosis, I lived in central California, which is a large farming area. I had only one serious health problem, which I had been dealing with since childhood, and that was depression. It was well controlled with medication, so I only saw my general practitioner once a year, and that was to get a renewal on my antidepressants and also to have a well woman exam, including a pap smear. About three months after my well woman exam and pap smear, I started to have symptoms of what was eventually diagnosed as ovarian cancer. Um, I mentioned this because 
since I started to have symptoms because the main tumor was so large by that time that it was pressing against my bladder and my bowel. So I do feel like when I had the pap smear, you know, I already had ovarian cancer, but of course the pap smear came back just fine because I didn't have cervical cancer. And unfortunately there's no early screening for ovarian cancer. Um, I'm just gonna go over my symptoms quickly. Uh, but my main symptoms were I was having a really bad problem with severe constipation, which did not respond to any normal measures uh, anybody would take for this problem, such as taking over-the-counter laxatives, drinking more water, eating more fiber, eating more fruits and vegetables, all the things we all know to do. Nothing was happening, was helping me. Um, and that was because the tumor, it turned out later when we finally, when I was diagnosed six months later, it turned out this tumor was pressing against my bowel and eventually compressed it to one third the size it should have been. Uh, but, you know, at the time I thought it was just a bad problem with constipation. I was also very bloated, but I, again, I attributed this to the fact that I just couldn't go to the bathroom. Um, I was losing some weight, but it wasn't a great deal of weight. I lost about eight pounds in six months. I had always been slender. I went from 120 pounds to about, I mean, 128 uh, to about 120. And it wasn't an alarming weight loss. And I really wouldn't have even noticed it except my doctor pointed out. I was also feeling full very quickly. But again, I just attributed this to the fact that when you're constipated, you're really aren't, don't get, at least I don't get very hungry. So again, I uh, just figured that was the reason I was feeling full so quickly. Um, my doctor thought I had irritable bowel syndrome and I thought I probably had that too. For the first time, I really had only gone to the doctor once a year. I was unusually healthy except for this problem with depression and it was well controlled. And uh, uh, part of the reason I only, I really didn't get sick very often. I went for years without even getting a cold. So for the first time I went to my doctor three times in six months. And the third time I went there, I said to him, you know, you can see from my records, I've never come in. I've never been here more than once a year, but now I feel very badly about five days out of seven. So I said, could I just get the medication for irritable bowel syndrome? Since that's what he thought I had. That's what I thought I had. He said he couldn't give me the medication unless I had some tests. So I had a pelvic ultrasound and, um, you know, he felt my abdomen and it felt very hard and he recommended a pelvic ultrasound. And then a few days later, I had a CAT scan. Um, the test showed that I had a very large tumor that had started on one ovary and had grown across my abdomen and was pressing against my bowel. By the time I had this test, six months into when I first had symptoms, the tumor, the main mass in my abdomen was nine inches by five inches, which was half the size of the infant I had given birth to when I was 25. She was 18 inches long. Um, the, the tumor, like I said, was pressing against the, the bowel and causing these severe problems. Uh, I had surgery. I, I was in the hospital for 12 days. And then about six weeks after that, I started on chemotherapy. I was in a clinical study, so I had a long chemotherapy. The particular trial I was in uh, lasted for uh, 16 cycles. It was supposed to go 13 months, but because I was delayed a lot of times because of blood tests, it ended up to be 16 months. But I had an excellent response to the chemo. Um, within just maybe the first cycle or two of chemotherapy, my cancer markers, the CA-125, had gone from over 3,000 back to under 35, which is, it was almost, it was remarkable. It was so quick. Um, and then I said, like I said, I had uh, the long cycle of chemotherapy. Although part of it, was, the second half of the chemo was only once a month, so it wasn't very strenuous at all. About two and a half years after um my first, uh, after about two and a half years, I had my first recurrence of cancer. By this time, I had moved closer to my family in Texas, in Houston, and I was also accepted at a medical center, a cancer center in Houston before I came because I was still being screened every three months. Uh, within two, two years after I got here, I had my first recurrence, and then I had 
two more within a six year period. But quite amazingly, I have not had a recurrence in eight years since 2012. Um, every now and then I would ask one of my doctors, like my doctor in California, and then when I moved down here, my cancer doctor here, and also I had a radiation uh, oncologist because during my second recurrence, I had radiation instead of chemotherapy because the cancer had only come back in one spot. So every now and then I would, not too often, but I would raise the question of genetic screening. And each time my doctor kind of gave me the same answer that because I come from a large Irish family with many women and there had been no history among my mother's or his, her sister's of gynecological cancer or breast cancer, about six years ago. The cancer center I go to changed their uh, policy six years ago and decided that anybody coming for treatment for ovarian cancer or screenings for ovarian cancer should have the genetic screening for the BRCA mutations. So I went to a genetic counselor. She took a very thorough family history. Again, I come from an Irish family. My mother was one of six women, six sisters, and uh, all of them lived to their late 80s, a uh, number into their 90s, and there had been no history of cancer. So the, the cancer, uh, the genetic counselor actually said after taking the family history, it was very unlikely that the test would come back that I was BRCA positive. However, it did come back that I'm BRCA2 positive. Um, so anyway, after that, they recommended, uh, the genetic uh, counselor recommended that I tell my first degree relatives, my siblings, and, you know, and they be tested and then any children I had, and I just had one daughter. So uh, my, my siblings were tested. It turns out that one of my sister's has the identical BRCA mutation I do. She's 10 years older than I am, but has never had cancer. My other two siblings were not carriers of this mutation. I also decided I should try to get hold of my cousins because I had many cousins. My mother had many sisters. We weren't sure what side of the family it came from. Fortunately, though, um, about two months after I got my test results, we were having the annual family reunion in Washington, D.C. of the, my cousins on my mother's side, which were the only cousins I really knew. Um, I did not know my father's family real well because I had grown up, grown up across the country from them. So anyway, when, when I went to this family reunion, I took the 11 or 12 cousins who were there, my first cousins, all the information about the my test results and also um, the information my cancer center had given me, or rather the genetic counselor had given me about how to find a genetic, uh, a genetic tester or counselor if they wanted to and go about getting the test. I felt for sure they would be interested in getting the test, even if their insurance didn't pay for it, because they were in their late 60s, 70s, and the oldest ones in their early 80s, all of them had grown children. Most of them had grown grandchildren or, or college age grandchildren. I knew they'd want to know the results. I knew they'd want to know if they had this gene for their children and grandchildren's sake. Um, most, almost all my cousins did decide to get tested. I think there were only two who did not get the test. And it turns out what we know was my mother is definitely positive. We, we knew that it wasn't my, it didn't come from my father's side. It came from my mother's side. My mother uh, passed this gene on to two of her four children and her younger sister passed it on to her three surviving children, all of whom tested for the identical mutation I had. Also, um, the three siblings of my, my, my aunt Kay, her three children, I'm sorry, uh, had a brother who died at a relatively early age, young age of aggressive prostate cancer. And I know now that the BRCA gene, the BRCA2 mutation is associated with aggressive prostate cancer. He had very good care at Johns Hopkins University. I mean, Johns Hopkins Hospital. Um, he had the best of care, but he only lived for six years. And uh, my cancer doctor feels like it's almost certain that if his three surviving siblings all have this mutation that he probably did too. But of course he died 
long before I, I ever had been tested for the BRCA mutation. Um, some of my, well, one of my nieces who has tested positive has, and also some of my cousin's children who have tested positive for this BRCA mutation have decided to have some preventative surgery to hopefully prevent ovarian cancer and breast cancer. Um, the ones who are in their 50s, not going to have any more children, they have had their ovaries removed. And um, one of my nieces, my sister's, one of her two children who have tested positive for this, has also decided to have a preventative mastectomy because her genetic counselor told her, her doctor, that there was about um, something like an 80% chance she would develop breast cancer over a lifetime. And they judged that from her age of 53 when she found out she was BRCA2 positive. So anyway, it's been very helpful to know this information for myself in case I get cancer again, in case I get ovarian cancer, I'll be eligible for certain treatments that I wouldn't have been eligible for if I wasn't BRCA2 positive. And of course, for my family, we are glad to know, my cousins are glad to know for their children and grandchildren's sake uh, about this very important information. So anyway, thank you. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you so much, Nancy, and thank you, Judy and Tanya. Um, we do have a few minutes for questions, and so uh, we will have our speakers' videos up, and if you'd like to ask a question, please either write it in the chat or um, unmute yourself and, and feel free to ask. I actually have a question for Tanya. Is Tanya still on? I'm here, hello. Oh, do you guys do uh, like a home um, genetics test, like you, uh, something you can do at home and send in to do a genetic testing? So many of the labs that we work with do have an option where we can send out a saliva collection kit to patients' home. We do still offer the option of having patients come in for blood draw if that's their preference, um, but getting a saliva collection kit is just as accurate. So you, do you do that at Baylor, your, your clinic yourself? So our clinic does utilize the saliva collection. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's become a lot more popular now with patients not always wanting to come in. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, right now we're able to offer the option of doing virtual visits, um, which is very much like what we're doing right now where we can see and hear each other through the computer or come in for a regular in-person visit. Um, but then we can also do the, the sample collection from home too, if need be. Hey, thank you, Nancy. I was going to ask you, um, what was that discussion like with, you said that you have a daughter and did she um, decide to get tested? And, and how was that discussion, particularly well, some yes. family members that didn't want to get tested? That was a difficult one because she had had her second child at 40 and she had had, she had first one in her early thirties, 33. And then it, she had a real hard time conceiving and with, um, anyway, donor egg and everything. She had her second baby. It, she was 40. And I, I felt I should get the information to her soon only because I knew at her age, she would want to consider having her ovaries removed fairly quickly since she, you know, she wasn't going to, have any more children. So when her baby was only two months old, I had to tell her about it. Um, and she opted right away, literally within a week, she had an appointment to uh, go to a genetic counselor. Um, luckily, my one child did not inherit this gene from me. I told her she'd run, won the genetic jackpot. She has the Ashkenazi da Jewish dad and the Irish mother and she might have inherited the gene from the Irish mother, um, but she didn't test positive. But uh, my sister's four children who've been tested, she has five children, one, you know, two have tested positive. And one's a, a man, but he needs to be screened more for breast cancer also. So, yeah. Exactly. Thank you. Yeah. But um, any other questions? Okay. Well, it seems like there aren't any additional questions. Thank you so much for sharing your story. Um, and we will have a survey 
that will go out to all the participants. So please complete that survey and evaluation. And also Susan is putting the survey in the chat. And so you can easily link to it from the chat. Um, thank you all so much to our speakers. I was not able to uh, attach that file to the chat for some reason. So can I send that to you, Pilar? And yeah, you certainly, yes. Yeah, and I can uh, forward it to Susan and we can distribute it. Okay. Right. Judy, let me just ask you one thing. Somebody sent me a message. I wasn't sure it was a question. It's at the bottom. I'm not sure how to pull it up, but it probably wasn't a question. It was a, it was a message from well, one of the people. Who thank you to Nancy for sharing your story and other example of yeah. power. Yeah, that wasn't a question. Oh, okay. Well, that's nice. That's <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah. Great. Well, thank you all so much. And thank you to everyone who joined. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Thank you, Nancy. Sure. Nice to see you again, Judy. You too.